Okay, everybody, what I want to do in this very quick video, and I apologize for my settings, we've recently moved houses, uh, and you can see my office is not quite set up behind me. Uh, but I'm grading right now, it's uh, midterms, and uh, one of the things I want to grade is um, the assignment that I've asked my graduate students to work on. Now, some of my graduate students are exceptionally good writers because they've come up in an academic setting. Some of my grad students have been out of school for a very long time. And this is by no means a critique of good and bad writing, but I want to show you some things you can watch for and do to improve your writing, uh, which is exactly what I'm going to do with this student right here. Uh, this is a good student. I've, I've known him for a little while. It is him. I'm not going to show the name, uh, or if I do, I'll come back and redact it, uh, because it, again, this is by no means a critique of his writing capability as much as it is a critique of his editing capability. Um, and there's just some things uh, that, that we need to, to work on here. So I've got my little list here. Um, what I thought I would do first is kind of go about what we mean by uh, organization. So as I flip through this, I see very long paragraphs and I see some uh, pretty decent uh, stuff here in terms of sources. Uh, but that's okay, they've been working on their sources, and I gave them this source to use. But um, the question came about is, the question in this paper is for them to critique whether or not what the author had said in the book, uh, and specifically this passage, is applicable to something else. And so that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for their answer, their, their analysis of that answer, what, why they support that answer. But that has to be relayed to me, uh, the reader, and in this case I'm the reader, in a way that makes sense and that communicates the thought and, and uh, support effectively and efficiently. And so there's some things that you should expect to do at the graduate level that will make that job easier for you. Uh, and I know in previous, I'm gonna adjust the camera here, I know in previous videos that I've done this I've kind of broken things down for you. This one's going to be more like tips and tricks. And so one of the first things that you have to do is one, make it readable, not just for you but for, and for your reader, but um, for the organization's aspect of it. You want to make something readable just because it makes it flow easier and it makes the transition of thoughts and to thoughts uh, a lot easier for your reader. And so I, I know what happens with students, and I was guilty of it too, is that you start to write and you get into this, um, you get into this mode where you gotta get everything down on paper, right? And that's exactly what's happened here. As I click here, you can see that this is one really long paragraph. Now I'm getting older and yeah, new glasses, new video, uh, my eyesight's starting to go a little bit, but that's okay, right? Make it easy on everybody else. What you want is you want your sentences to be between your paragraphs. I mean, to be four and five sentences in length. Um, after four to five, four to five sentences, uh, move on to another paragraph. And if that means you need to condense your idea down in that one paragraph, then condense it. But what I want to see is, uh, let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five. So we would start with our government and many private businesses utilize the cyber realm to develop and improve production. Okay, so maybe six in that case. Um, that's enough. You've made your opening statement. Uh, so here is where I would say, let's take a paragraph break. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kinda cheat a little bit here. I have some, I have some grading things here in my turn it in feedback. Uh, let's put a paragraph break there and start the next paragraph according to a 2014 congressional report. Hey, that's a great way. You segmented on that businesses and private businesses utilize the cyber realm. Uh, then you, you've, that's a great transition statement. Which kind of brings me to my next point, transition statements. You don't want to go from one paragraph to another without there being some sort of linking sentence or idea between them. Um, it, at that point it becomes disjointed if that's missing. I will lose track of what you're saying. Remember that although I, I consider myself a pretty smart person, I may not know exactly what you're talking about. It may not be an interest uh, that I have followed exclusively for years. 
you may be trying to win over somebody. You may be trying to convince someone of your idea or thought. Uh, in which case, you don't need to treat them like an idiot, right? But you do need to treat them like perhaps they don't know what you're talking about. Lay it out for them. Give them a road to follow in your thoughts. So transition statements, and this is actually a pretty decent one. Our government and many private businesses utilize the cyber realm uh, to improve production, provide communication, uh, and store and create sensitive information. So, and then it goes right into, hey, this is how many, this is how many do it, and this is uh, this is how many of these state agencies have been hacked and compromised. So you're setting out the the, the nature of it, why it's so important, and then you're going right on into that there's some vulnerabilities here. So that's just transitions, right? Uh, that helps set up the organization of this. You're making your point, you're supporting your point, you're moving on to the problem statement, uh, which is what you would do in an outline. So if you haven't set up an outline for your paper, take the three minutes. It takes three minutes to set up an outline. What it is you want to talk about. Why is it important? What support do you have for that? What claim are you going to make with it? And you do those things and you're going to have a stellar paper every time. Now you'll fumble on some other things, right? But that's that happens. Okay, so let's take the next part. Um, what do I mean by uh, tone? So if you can see this paper, and I know you can, uh, the first word of the very first sentence of the very first paragraph is an immediate red flag. That is what's called informal tone. And this is how I'll mark it. Uh, I will actually mark it with uh, a thing that says tone. Whoops, let's not go that far. Let's scroll down a little bit more here and let's mark it with tone. That was close. All right, so what do we mean by tone? Tone sets the, the, the way that it will be interpreted by your reader. When you are being formal, and in academic papers like this one, uh, you're expected to have a very formal tone. Well, now, what does that mean? It means that you should refrain from slang. Uh, so no slang terms. Um, isn't, uh, conjunctions, ain't, ain't is slang. It's, it's, it, although it's in the unabridged Oxford Dictionary, it is still considered slang. Chillax. You should not have that in an academic paper. Um, you would not want your professor to read anything that was not conducive to that you were presenting a well-formed and logical supported argument. This is not about your understanding of modern culture. This is about your understanding of the problem, your support and issue and critical thinking of solving that problem, and your ability to communicate your ideas effectively and thoroughly. Uh, so you want to stay away from things like contractions, slang. You also want to stay away from uh, from first and second person use. So first person, I, me, we, us. Uh, second person, your, our. Uh, second person is the possessive. So right out of the gate, I see our nation is exclusively relied upon, is exclusively relied upon cyberspace. Uh, so I would change that to the United States is exclusively relied upon in, in terms of cyberspace. So you can make that and you can make it far more poignant without using the word we or our or your. Think of formal papers as almost clinical. Um, how doctors remove themselves from patients. They set themselves aside for multiple reasons, but they set themselves aside from their patients and the clinicalness of what we do in terms of medicine. I want you to treat academic formal papers the same way. Uh, you want to be presenting the idea and argument in a sustained, systematic, and formal way. Um, and so in that regard, uh, you need to keep it as formal as possible. Now, if I were to ask you for a reaction paper, I want you to react, what are your opinions on this? Then, by all means, uh, you, I feel, and I support, and we need to. Those are all very appropriate for a reaction paper. But when you come to write a like an applied research paper, is what we call a non-thesis option, uh, or if you go to write a thesis, or you're writing a dissertation, you want to keep that extremely formal, uh, because that's going to go to publish, and they, they expect that to be very formal in nature. 
so every day we as a nation rely on the internet and the cyber world. Okay, so here's some things, right? Every day, comma, we as a nation rely on the internet and the cyber world. Okay, so two things here. One, make sure that you're putting your commas in correctly. Um, commas in the wrong place, that's a grammatical error. So you always want to check for grammar. Don't necessarily rely on Word to do that for you. Uh, Word does not always do this correctly. Um, you can adjust the settings in Word to or full. But if you see a bunch of red squiggly lines in your paper, then by all means, take a look at those. Have somebody else read it. Um, you know, what does it cost to get somebody else to read a paper? Uh, especially in, in this case, this is uh, about uh, one-tenth of their grade. So the, yes, there are ten other things in, in this uh, course that they have to, to produce for me, but uh, why take a chance? I, I expect everything to be uh, above par for a graduate level course. Um, but in this case, get somebody to proof it. Proofing doesn't take long. I had my own parents proof my papers. Uh, my parents were kind enough and I was lucky enough that my parents had multiple degrees in English and journalism and things like that, so it was very easy for me to rely on that. But I would have happily paid somebody or bought a beer for someone to uh, proof my papers. Uh, another thing, it's just a small thing, uh, the word internet. So when you're talking about the internet as an internet-based something, then you're using it as an adjective. So I, I run something and it uses the internet. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, it uses an internet, which is a co combination of networks, or it uses the internet, meaning the entire global network of computer systems. If you're talking about the entire global network, the one that spans the whole thing, then it's capitalized because the internet is actually a proper noun. Uh, we refer to the internet as an all-encompassing network on the global network when we refer to it it is capitalized uh, a lot of people don't know that so I'm not just nitpicky on that one uh, I will correct you along the way uh, so yeah that's some small things um, like you know just making sure you have paragraphs paragraph breaks in there again four to five sentences uh, that'll do a lot let me see what else we got here um, okay so you don't need to cite every single sentence or every other sentence. If you haven't seen it already, I've got a video called um, Citation Blocks, how to use them. And I'll see if I can't put that up in some sort of comment that I've never done before, but I'll try to put it up there for you. And that you can utilize that. It'll teach you how to kind of minimize the number of citations you have to do, yet still watch out for plagiarism, right? It still helps you focus your citations in a, in a way that will keep you from plagiarizing technically. And um, yeah, so those are some small things. Um, yeah, that's all I really have for this video. Some uh, things about utilizing books and author names. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, this right here in his in his book, Optimizing Cyber Deterrence. It's a, a guy named Robert Mandel wrote this book. Um, you don't need to put that in there. Like if you describe Mandel and you're referencing the citation, you don't need the book title. That that can just, just straight out. I can just straight out go. So here's how I would edit that for the student. I would simply strike that out. Um, Mendel describes several failures in cyber cyber deterrence. Period. Our government, the government. So I would strike this out, and I would put the government and the rest of Western society needs to rethink uh, how how we provide needs to rethink providing cyber deterrence to critical infrastructure. Great sentence. Still this student's words, right? But all I've done is polish it a little bit. And it's that editing that you should take a look at. If you're interested in learning how to edit, um, I suggest a, a book called uh, On Writing by none other than Stephen King. Uh, it's about how to go out and, and write. Uh, really, it's about how to go out and edit. Uh, most people are actually somewhat decent writers. They just don't know how to edit and revise. And so if you really want a good book on that, it'll take you 20 
maybe 25 minutes to get through the first couple of chapters, which are very funny, by the way. It's a very humorous book. You wouldn't think Stephen King had a huge sense of humor, but he does. Uh, but it goes through about how to write a book, how to write a manuscript, and ultimately edit it down correctly, still make it very strong, make it very formal, and have a lot of fun with it. So that's all I have for this video. Um, hopefully this has been helpful to you. Uh, if you like it, great, give me a thumbs up. If you don't like it, then okay, sorry. <laughs> In the meantime, again, I hope it's been helpful to you. Uh, and as always, study well and have a good class. All right. Bye, guys.